But there's another issue. This is more of a theological and doctrinal issue. We've heard this phrase over and over again. It's used in the scripture. Paul uses it a number of times, nearly a dozen times. We are not under law, but under grace. And we hear that. We say, amen, hallelujah, praise the Lord. We are not under law, we are under grace. Now, it's one thing to use that terminology. It's another thing altogether to understand that terminology. We know that we live during a period of theological illiteracy and biblical illiteracy. So if you give somebody a phrase like that, and they don't have an understanding of the Bible, and they don't have a grasp on systematic theology or biblical theology, what do they come away with? They come away with all that stuff on the left side of the Bible is irrelevant to us. Here's what they also come away with. I don't have to examine my life or walk in any way in light of or in accordance with the law of God. Why should I? I'm no longer under law. I'm under grace. So that's the understanding that many people have. So we're embarrassed about things that we find in the law of God. And we're confused about God's law in light of the kingdom of God. And as a result of it, we either stay away from it, or if we don't just stay away from it altogether, we misunderstand and misinterpret our relationship to the law. And as a result of that, here's what we see. Listen to this from J.I. Packer. The root of our trouble, putting it quite plainly, seems to be that we neither know nor care much about the law of God. On the one hand, we do not give ourselves to studying and applying law in the way that our evangelical forefathers did. Our neglect of the Old Testament in particular bears witness to this. On the other hand, our thinking, unlike theirs, has a lawless tinge. There is an antinomian streak. Antinomianism means no law. There is an antinomian streak running through it. We act as if our freedom from the law has made it a matter of comparative unimportance whether we keep the law in daily life or not. We appear to care more for right faith than we do for right living. We show a greater concern to be orthodox than to be upright. We seem to be more anxious to know the truth than we are to adorn it by our behavior. We are, it appears, more interested in feeding our own souls than in doing good to our neighbor. We lap up the doctrinal chapters of the epistles, but we skate over the ethical ones. Our Lord accused the Pharisees of antinomianism, telling them that they had overlooked the weightier demands of the law, justice, mercy, good faith. Would he not have reason to bring a similar accusation against us? Here, then, is the root cause of our present moral flabbiness. We have neglected God's law. Hear, hear. We have neglected God's law. Well, so what does that mean? I mean, does that does that mean that we need to go and, you know, erect a law around the law like the Pharisees did? Does that mean that we... What, what, What does that mean? Well, I'm glad you asked. In our passage today, we get an answer to that question. Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 17, we have the key not only to understanding the entire Sermon on the Mount. Think about it this way. If, if, if if, If you looked at this as an essay, if you looked at the Sermon on the Mount as an essay, and we teach... Our young people how to write essays, and some of you young people are so tired of writing essays. You know, anybody in the room just wish you never again heard 131 in your life? Anybody in the room, you know, yes, thank you, Lord, no more 131. I don't want to write a 131, you know. You write your first paragraph, and, of course, at the end of your first paragraph, you have to have your thesis statement, and in your thesis statement, you give your arguments, and then you have your three chapters in the 131, which basically expound expound on your thesis statement. Then you have your concluding paragraph where you wrap the whole thing up, and wah, 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 wah. Okay? You know what? If the Sermon on the Mount was a 131, 
Our paragraph today, verses 17 through 20, would be the thesis statement. This is Jesus' whole argument in the Sermon on the Mount. It's the key to understanding everything that he's about to say, not just on, in the Sermon on the Mount, but listen, this paragraph is the key to understanding everything that Jesus does, says, and is in relationship to the law of God. This single paragraph. Let's examine it. Verse 17. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. What a thesis statement. What a close to his thesis statement. You don't get this right. You don't understand this. You're never going to enter the kingdom of heaven. This is the foundation of the kingdom ethic. If you remember, we talked about Christian ethics and how the Sermon on the Mount is really a foundation for Christian ethics, for the ethics of the kingdom. Right actions, right motives, right goals. And here, in this one paragraph... He gives us the foundation upon which all of that is to be built. 